Hello and welcome to the Art Class Curator podcast. I am Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator and the Curated Connections Library. We're here to talk about teaching art with purpose and inspiration, from the daily delights of creativity to the messy mishaps that come with being a teacher. Whether you're driving home from school or cleaning up your classroom for the 15th time today, take a second, take a deep breath, relax those shoulders, and let's get started. Hey everybody, it's Cindy Ingram from Art Class Curator, and I am so excited about this interview today with Danny Koch from Oh Happy Danny. She has an incredible story about how she used her art to make a difference and how her art sort of went viral overnight and really changed her life. But the way she explains her artistic process and the power of her art just gave me chills as she was talking about it. There is so much possibility here for you in your classroom. So I cannot wait to share with you this interview. So let's go for it. All right. I'm so excited to welcome Danny Koch to the Art Class Curator podcast. Welcome, Danny. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I have been binging your Instagram channel and, <laughs> and all of your content and online, and we are so excited to share your story with our listeners because you have done some pretty amazing, inspirational things over the last couple of years. So can you tell us a little bit more about you and your background and your experiences? Yes, absolutely. So, yep, I'm Danny. I am 26 currently, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I claim that I was raised in the suburbs of Georgia because that's where I moved when I was around six and that's where I grew up outside the city. And last year I actually moved into the city for the first time, which is super exciting. And so that's currently where I live. And yes, I have been into creativity and art and creating things for a really long time. So I've always been into creativity and art, making things with my hands. Like when I was younger, I would put together gift baskets and I would paint like terracotta pots. I even designed business cards to do like lawn care for my neighbors. But like, I was not into lawn care. I just wanted to design the business card, you know? So yep. <laughs> I've, always, I've always been into creativity and things like that. And I majored in business in college with a hospitality administration because I wanted to get into event planning. And I thought that that was going to be my career and my life. And I got a job at an event planning agency right when I graduated. And I quickly realized that event planning was not going to be my career and it was not going to be my life. Yeah. But my way in the door was graphic design. And so I just fell more and more in love with it. And while I was at that job, I also had a lot of experiences related to race, being a black woman in a predominantly white space. And I had moments where I would bring up to my boss, like, hey, I would love if we could start conversations around diversity and equity and inclusion, maybe bring in a speaker. And he told me, you know, that's not something I'm interested in or will ever be interested in. And so that moment nice. kind of, yeah, illustrated to me, no pun intended, that mm -hmm. I, <laughs> that wasn't the environment that I felt like I could truly thrive in. And so yeah, late 2019, I quit my job, started my graphic design business and continued to do that through 2019 and picked up illustration as a hobby Christmas of 2020. And so I've been nice. illustrating ever since. Wow. So that's a, that's a pretty fast, uh, yes. Go from, you know, starting your own business to being as successful as you are. I think you have like, how many followers do you have? I know around <laughs> a lot. I think right now I'm at around 484,000. That's amazing. Yeah. And it was absolutely wild. like so fast tracked. And as someone who worked in marketing, graphic design, and social media, never have I ever in my life seen anything like what happened last year. So yeah, it has definitely been a wild ride. Yeah. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But did you make the painting on the wall behind you? <gasps> yes, I did. <laughs> oh, I'm obsessed yeah. with it. It's so good. <laughs> yes. There was, a, there was a period last year where I was just super burnt out with always wanting to make everything so methodical because my illustrations, as you know, are infographics, very yeah. detailed. And I was like, I just want to get back to the creativity of it. So I freehanded this mural. Oh, and it's so pretty. It so down there too. Uh, and so it matches us. <laughs> Sorry, the listeners can't hear this. I'm going to, can I screenshot you? Can you like smile? Sure. Um, my door, whatever. I'll just, move. Oh, I don't see the door. Oh, okay. Perfect. Oh, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's just so cute. I just right. can't. And you did the paint, you did the paintings too that matched uh, to it. No, or were I there, those I were Target. Nice. 
So um, good. Okay. My phone case inspired my mural. We are just off topic, but I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, it's I okay. Just keep... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I love to see like creative people and what they do. And I think it's just, it's fun to see that those sort of threads. And I love yeah. to, in your story, you were talking about the business cards and stuff. And that's how I know, like sort of a creative entrepreneur type of person always has those stories of mine yes. was that I sold a campaign poster, presidential campaign posters to my neighbors. Like that's oh, when I was wow. like eight. I don't know. So yeah, that's actually we, kind we of all those little stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was and it was for an, a candidate I would not have supported today, but <laughs> that's okay. We will, uh, y'all, y'all can probably guess uh, what side that is, but I won't, I won't go there. <laughs> okay, so we'll go back on topic. So let's go into what happened when you gained all those followers at one time last year. Can you explain yeah. kind of what happened? And Yeah, definitely. So while always being creative and loving to create things, I've also always had this passion for justice, racial reconciliation, what that looks like now and my role in that story. And when I started out my agency, the name of the agency was called So Happy Social, which might sound very familiar because my Instagram name is Oh Happy Danny, but So Happy Social actually came first. And I only changed my personal handle for branding purposes. (laughs) But yeah, the whole point behind So Happy Social was to equip positive mission-based brands to use social media for maximum impact. And so I wanted to get behind the nonprofit leaders, the on the ground people doing the work and say, you don't have time to worry about social media, so I will do it for you. And I was I was like, yeah, that'll be my place, my unique contribution while still doing what I love and am passionate about. And so that if that's all I ever ended up doing with my life, I would have been content. But fast forwarding a little bit to January of 2021, I had gotten my iPad for Christmas the following year. I mean, the, the previous year. And I was drawing all these random things and Martin Luther King Jr. Day came and I was like, huh, I kind of want to make an illustration about how it irks me that people take his legacy and really paint it as this passive, you know, peacekeeping legacy when in all actuality, he was quite radical. He was a disruptor. He challenged the status quo, encouraged civil disobedience. Like this man was not liked. And so I wanted to make an illustration to kind of shine a light on that perspective for like my 700 friends on Instagram. And so I drew that and posted it. And it was the first illustration that was justice related, but also the first one that was shared outside of my friend group. I was like, people are sharing this to their story. That is so bizarre to me. And so I said, huh, I wonder Black History Month is coming up. If I stay in the vein of creating illustrations related to justice, I wonder if more people would be inclined to participate in those kinds of conversations if the art was pretty, aesthetically pleasing, simple, but yet not sacrificing the depth of information. And so I did that all of February 2020. I just started talking about all different topics related to Black lives, Black flourishing, and justice for the Black community. So I talked about everything from why it's important to see color and not say that you don't see color to why you shouldn't put your hands in a black woman's hair without her permission. You know, things, you know, you just got to cover all the bases. You never know who you're speaking to, you know? Yeah. And so I went on a rampage doing that and I had a lot of fun. And by the end of February, I had about 10 K people following me. I was like, that is bizarre. Like, <laughs> uh, but, it's making art and people are liking it. <laughs> and they're liking it and they're showing yeah. up. And I was like, okay, yeah. I'll keep going. And then um, summer approached and then we, you know, Black Lives Matter took center stage in a major way mm-hmm. all over the world. And then we witnessed the tragic deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. And I began to use art to speak to those situations as well. And my first viral piece of art um, happened following Ahmaud Arbery's murder when I made a post from a Kamala Harris quote that basically said, exercising while Black should not be a death sentence. And so I illustrated that and it it was my first piece to go like way viral. And I, overnight, it seemed that things really just went on a fast track. I, in one week, gained, like you said, about 300,000 followers. And I started having all these incredible opportunities to speak places and go on like daytime shows and work with incredible brands. And it all felt very unexpected, but I was pleased to know that my unique contribution, however small I thought it was when I first started out, ended up being used in a wild way, especially since people don't always see art as a viable tool for activism. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, at least they didn't. That's changed now, but 
people, yeah, people would pit it against each other. Art is like meant to invoke emotion. Activism is meant to encourage action. But when you put the two together, you have a powerful tool. You're invoking, you're encouraging action by invoking emotion. And I think that was very powerful and still is. Yeah, I really love that you pointed out that your art is pretty (laughs) because I noticed that too. I was like, you know, she's talking about really important, deep things, but it's, and really like, you know, the, the things in your art is if, if it gets in the right hands, it is going to make change, you know, just by the content, but you've put it, you, it, it's in such a accessible format that it's so easily shared. Like you put something so pretty up, people are just more likely to share it. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's like this like sneak attack almost. Oh, but, definitely. Yeah. It was definitely a tool, a strategy for me for the longest time and still is. And even with, the images themselves, like I'll use it to draw people in. And then in the caption, I might, I might slice you up with some of the stuff I'm saying, (laughs) but you know, it's all part of the process of hopefully helping people to see things that they might not have otherwise looked at in that way. Yeah. And that uh, side note, but not a side note to the listeners that are listening. I think that showing some of your art to their student, to the students, would be a really powerful conversation because not only you do you get to ta- have the conversations about the stuff that's that you're illustrating about, mm-hmm. but then the, t- the art teacher can talk about, um, well, what did this artist do to make the message come across? Like what, what mm-hmm. strategies did she use? And I think that oh, that's yeah. another really powerful conversation too. So I think that um, I hope, I hope from listening to this, we have some teachers that that go out and do that. And if you do listeners, please tell us how it went. Cause we want to hear about it. Yeah. That's really cool. Okay. So what did that feel like to have things sort of explode for you like that? It's like a really awful, but empowering time, but also you're having this like amazing personal success at the same time. How did that sort of duality feel? Yeah. So I definitely had moments when I didn't balance it well. Burnout definitely happened. And part of what happened with gaining that huge platform so quickly is that I took on the personal responsibility of speaking to Every thinking that I had to speak to every single tragic thing happening in the country or in the world and had to have some sort of profound statement. And then when I was at a loss for words, like, well, that's just unacceptable because there's half a million people waiting on you to say something. And I really internalized that pressure in a way that was not healthy or practical. And so that was a huge, huge and more really difficult part of it because even with my process, which I, we can probably get into later with the creation process of the art. But sure. I think for me, a lot of people see it and it's like, oh, simple, cute. But I also do think that people also understand the fact that it's a very difficult process, like taking in what's happening globally or or in our nation, narrowing it down to a couple of points, conceptualizing it into an illustration that people can connect with. Mm -hmm. And then disseminating that information in a way that doesn't sacrifice the integrity of the subject matter. Oh, (laughs) listen, (laughs) it is not, it is not an easy process. I'm just stressed out hearing the process. So, And I, because of the platform and the weight of it, I would much rather not make a graphic about a topic than to disseminate harmful information. Yes. Uh, it's just something that I've had to wrestle with. And I, I cannot be, I said, you cannot be the answer to every problem. Like you can't think an infographic will change the whole world all the time. And so that ha- came along with it, but it also brought a, such a beautiful community and people would probably be surprised. I received a lot of hate when I first started, but after that, ever since the majority of what I get 97% of the time is love. Which is shocking, considering how it really is. polarizing it is what I'm talking about. But I think what what is so cool about the audience is whether you agree with me all the way or not, you can't deny that what I'm saying is oftentimes something that needs to be discussed, is an important thing. And it's not me trying to convince you of anything. It's me presenting information to you that you can go and do with what needs to be done, you know? And so, yeah also releasing the pressure to convince people to believe what I believe has made this a lot easier as well. How did you get through all of that struggle at the beginning and the pressure that you were feeling? Like what strategies helped you through that? Yeah. I think feeling the weight of that immense pressure often enough make, made me not want to feel it anymore. So, you know, like yeah. you can only bear it for so long before you're like, all right, get off of me, you know? And yeah. so 
that's kind of what that was for me. I just had to keep realizing like, oh, I hate this feeling. Oh, I hate this feeling to prioritize not feeling that way. So when it first all happened, I was like the Energizer Bunny, like making a bunch of graphics and then launching things and new products and a store. And now I have a whole second business. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> It was just going really fast. But then I would take chunks of time away from social media and not tell anybody I was leaving and come back and be able to speak to the next moment because I took the time away to recharge and energize myself without feeling as though I owed anyone an explanation for anything. Yeah. My coach always says rest is a business strategy, you know, Ooh, and I think yeah. that's true for teachers too, that, that are listening because uh, most of you are not running businesses, but you know, that yeah. time that you're spending resting, the time you're spending turning off the lesson plans, stopping grading, like that is going to make you a better teacher because mm. you've given yourself that. So I think that's really important yeah. message there. So I don't necessarily have a question about this. So I'm going to try to figure this out. So you 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 describe that process of taking it and disseminating it and your 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 process for creating something. Yeah. And it was you ran through that so fast and it was like really Sorry. Incredible. Yeah, no, I'm just like, wow. And I and I hadn't even like thought about that as a thing to ask, but now I'm just like, we have got to talk about that because that is really yeah. shows the creative process in such a beautiful way. So can we just dive into that more? I don't know Absolutely. exactly what the question is, but like how do you start? Yeah, definitely. So here's what normally happens. There will be a trending topic, breaking news headline, and it'll lead to a lot of discussions online. And I always prize myself, uh, or I always encourage myself, I should say, to not feel the need to be a breaking news source or consistently talk about all that's trending all the time. It's just not feasible. And so in those moments, I like to remember, okay, your job is to speak to the heart of the matter. What is that piece of truth that you can pull out of all the chaos? Like, what is that one simple thing that someone can cling to? And so that's what I'll start with. And it'll take me in in a certain direction. So I can actually give you an example of a piece and walk you through that as I talk about this, but that'd be great. Yeah. So earlier this year, uh, the topic of anti-Asian racism and hate was like, top of mind. And so a lot of conversations were happening about that. And the year before, actually, so not this year, but last year, when COVID was starting to spike, we were seeing a very similar thing. People weren't talking about it as much because Black Lives Matter was so loud in that moment, rightfully so. But I remember that it was still very much a problem, anti-Asian hate. And so one thing that I was hearing a lot of rhetoric from government officials and people around us was that it was an Asian virus or like that they were tying COVID-19 to an entire group of people in a very harmful way. And so Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I see what's going on here. What are some points that I need to pull out of this that I can communicate to the audience in a simple way uh, that it's really important that we take control of this narrative and not perpetuate harmful stereotypes. And so that was the first thing I did. And then the Next thing I was doing, I also group that in with listening. I call it listening. I I like to say that I have my ears to the ground, especially when these things are happening. I listen to what's happening in the community at large, but I also listen to what's happening in my own community. What questions are people asking? What dialogue are they having amongst themselves? And that also helps to inform what I want to say, because often what we're talking about amongst each other is where we're trying to figure out the heart of things. How can I apply it and internalize what's happening in my own life? And so that's where I like to live. Mm -hmm. And so that happened. And then I narrowed down to maybe five points, four steps, three ways, or one simple like quote or thought. So in this instance, I wanted to pull three points out. So I got that list and then I move on to conceptualizing. And so I take the content. So in this instance, I wanted to do an illustration that talked about thing. I called it uh, three pills you need to swallow about the coronavirus. And cause you know, I'm very literal. Yeah. And then, so I conceptualize a pill bottle and three literal pills. And so under pill number one, I said, diseases can make you sick. Diseases can make anyone sick from any ethnicity, right? That was point number one. Point number two, people of Asian descent are not more likely to contract the virus. Point number three, fear of getting sick is not a valid excuse for xenophobia or racism. So those were three points I wanted to drive home. Seems obvious now looking back, but man, oh man, during the height of the hysteria, people were wild. Okay. 
And so I said, okay, I think the concept of a pill bottle and a bunch of pills will make a lot of sense in this conversation of COVID. Let me illustrate that. Those will be my points. And then research, especially like to get to that point is huge for me as well. Making sure I have credible sources that I'm citing, that all the information is accurate, things like that. And so at the end, I have an illustration that is hopefully simple and digestible and you've got takeaways, but the process getting there is a lot of listening, a lot of planning, writing out things, illustrating. And I would say illustration is probably 15% of the process. Yeah. I don't spend too long doing that. Yeah. That's a, I think that all the teachers listening need to have your students listen to everything you just said, because it just (laughs) was so good. Um, What do you do about, you know, I noticed that in this, in the world of sort of fighting these injustices and things Mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people who are just ready to immediately nitpick anything you say, even if you're on like the side that they're on, Mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, but what about this? Oh, you you said this wrong. Like you use this word and you really should have used this word. Or do you get a lot of, do you Uh, get a lot of that? You know, I love this question because the answer is no, because I am so careful. Yeah. I write something, I read it a million times. I write it a bunch of different ways. And I can even give you an example. Like a lot of talk is happening right now around language that we can use to be more inclusive to people in disabled communities. Mm -hmm. Words that we might throw around often that actually would be more helpful if we didn't. And I think that's a really good example of the fact that language is ever changing and evolving, but it's important while we don't get tied to language because of the fact that it's like kind of a living thing, I still believe that as often as we're able to make sure we're adopting inclusive language for the purpose of not causing any confusion or distraction as we try to convey our information. And so I would rather, uh, for example, I do not often use the word crazy in my vocabulary. I've said wild a lot of times and I opt for Mm -hmm. wild just for the purpose of not wanting to distract from what I'm saying by using a term that someone else might see as, oh, I didn't really, you know what I mean? And so you can't do that with everything, but as often as I'm able, I will make those swaps for the sake of one inclusion and to lessen distraction because I don't want you to give me any excuse as to why you weren't able to hear the point that I'm trying to make, but also I don't want to cause harm while trying to convey that information either. And so that goes for things as simple as language changes or as important as conveying this huge subject, like the school to prison pipeline, for example, is it something I made an illustration about last year? And I was very particular, even with the way I illustrated students on that illustration. It's like, make sure whatever community you're talking about, say that community. Don't just lump everybody into this giant category. Like who is most affected by this? You know, it's just very important to be as clear as possible, as clear as possible. And so I always lead with that, which is why research is such a huge chunk of my process. Mm -hmm. So very, very rarely, if ever, do I have pushback over like semantics or the way I use my words, which I'm very- That's really good. That shows that you're very thoughtful. Do you have, uh, do you run your copy and stuff by, by, by different communities and stuff before you do the illustration or do you just keep it with yourself? Uh, So mostly I keep it with myself. It helps that I'm a part of an underrepresented community because I, I have proximity, but also if I'm talking about another community, chances are that I'm learning from people who are members of that community. And so I I connect with them with my illustrations or my verbiage and I'll say, what Mm -hmm. do you think would be best to include here? But I think more than anything, I've started to send my illustrations for second eyes over my captions and words because spelling. (laughs) 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 I don't spell things wrong. (laughs) And teachers are like the most supportive uh, members of my community, like I've, there's so much support, but teachers really show up for me. And so with that, they show up in them comments and say, um, you were supposed to use the possessive form of it's yep. that one has an apostrophe. And I'm like, you got me. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. You're correct. And so, yeah, I've been trying to prevent that as much as I can. Cause Oh yeah. They, they let can. me know. They let me they, know. They let me know too. It's like on page 46 of this document. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, yep. Thank you for catching that. <laughs> right. I'd be really grateful for real. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's a lot to keep up with. So, yeah. wow. That's, it's such a, it's so interesting. Cause I think 
I'm lost in the possibility of showing your art to students and I'm having a hard time getting away from it because I keep <laughs> I keep going off in my imagination, but I think uh, it's such a, such a powerful lesson. So, yeah. so speaking of teaching, did you have a influential teacher that sort of helped you along your path? Yes, I did. And it's funny because I have influential teachers that have affected me in both positive and negative ways, like very specifically. And mm-hmm. I think I'm going to tell you the negative influence first, because you'll find that it is actually quite relevant to the subject matter of your own (laughs) podcast. (laughs) Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. (laughs) Yes. And so when I was in middle school, I told you all throughout my childhood, I was very creative, always making things. And so I got to middle school and an art elective was an opportunity. And I was like, absolutely, this is my time. And so I really enjoyed that class. We did a whole lot of different things, but we had one activity every Friday that was a free write, a free drawing activity. And so basically Friday is when it was due, but you would get a piece of paper at the top of the week, take it home, draw something, bring it back on Friday for a grade. And so I loved that. We got this long paper too. It was really cool. So I would take that home and I would draw Disney characters because I really love Disney. Oh, and yeah. so I had all these small, like, you know, VHS covers. And I would put the VHS, uh, like I would stand it up and then I would sit with my paper and I would draw the character like big. And I loved doing it. And I impressed myself with how close it would look to the, to the thing. So it made me really excited. <laughs> and I, I'd bring it in on Fridays. And I remember the very first time I brought mine in and I drew Ariel from The Little Mermaid on that big rock uh, on the, like she was on the cover. And, and I uh, turned it in for a grade and the teacher gave it back to me and she was like, please make sure to not be tracing B minus. And she wrote that on the paper. And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, well, first of all, you could have asked me if I I was tracing, but she kind of just, it felt to me that she assumed that I traced and marked it down because of that. And so she never asked me, we never had a conversation about it, but every single time I turned in a free drawing, a freehand drawing of a Disney character every Friday, I would never get an A. It would always be like, please be sure not trace C plus or B minus with like no reason. And it's very odd to me how she, I just don't, would love to know to this day how she decided <laughs> to find those grades to my art. But it was discouraging for me definitely because it felt to me as though like that could have been an opportunity for you to affirm an, a natural gift, but uh-huh. you decided to assume that it wasn't. Yeah, that makes sense if you, you've been teaching this kid for three months and you've seen them, all of their art that they make, and you've seen their drawing ability, and then they turn in this like beautifully perfect thing. I think every art teacher has experienced that. And you're like, mm, no, I, there's a disconnect right, here. Right. But you you just met this teacher. She didn't know who you were. Like, yeah. And at, throughout the entire course. talk to you about it. Yeah. Throughout the entire time, like I would make other art in class. My art would get good grades. Like it was a consistent thing. And I wish like I could even have the opportunity uh, to draw in class and be like, like, if you want me, I could sit my VHS tape right, tape right here and I could take my big piece of paper and draw it. So you can see, I know that's like not always feasible, but I really feel as though that assumption, although it makes sense, like she's looking at it as like, mm, that's pretty. It would have really been more encouraging for me if she would have asked. Yeah. yeah. Or, just have a conversation point. about it. Yeah. Just a conversation. That's crazy. And so, yeah, throughout the entire time, like she would mark me down low. Uh. And so I just was like, well, let me not even bother then. And didn't consider pursuing art as a career option. I just took it off the list. Oh, it was like, it was enough to completely discourage you from Oh, yeah. Art throughout the altogether. entire class, you're going to keep uh. marking me down and accusing me of doing something I'm not doing? And then me, again, a predominantly white space, my teacher is white. I'm a student mm. of color. I don't feel safe to come to you and say, if you've already been treating me this way, I don't feel safe to come to you and be yeah. like, hey, I'd like to talk about this. Like, that's not something I would want to initiate. I don't know. I'll just take it and just forget about it. Mm-hmm. So it was very easy for me to do. And so, I, I mean, I, I continue to draw here and there in my own time, but I just did not think of it as like a goal, like a life. Option. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's quite a lesson. It really is. This because I'm sure that that teacher. Oh, I don't even know. I went, I was going to make assumptions about her, but then that would I was like, that's going to be wrong. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> yeah, and so you never know knows what she's all about. Yeah, I th- I think all the only the thing that would have made it better for me would have been a conversation. Yeah, yeah, for her to be I curious think. about it rather than yeah. just to make to assume that you're 
right. that you're tracing. That's- yeah, exactly. And so that was, that was, yeah, definitely influenced me in the opposite direction. But I did have mm-hmm. another really amazing teacher. She was my chorus teacher. And she just consistently encouraged me and consistently, I felt like, really believed in me and my creative ability on that set and on that front of music. And uh, so much so that she made me feel like I had the ability to try out for the, a lead in the musical my senior year. And then I got it. It was Les Mis. Oh. Yeah, we did Les Mis. And I, I don't know why we thought we could do Les Mis. But we did <laughs> Les Mis in high school. And I, I tried out to be Fontaine. And it was just a really fun experience that really changed my life because I was like, I can do really hard things and I can do them well. And that I consistently came back to that whole experience in my mind throughout my life. Like if I could do that, I could do this. And so I love that. Yeah. Being pushed and someone, it was the exact opposite experience. Like she saw the talent in me instead of, you know, writing it off, she invested in it and encouraged me to see it through. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. My daughter just tried out for her first musical yesterday. I cannot handle the weight. I know she can't either, but I'm like, I need to know Ooh, she that weight. And then they upload <laughs> that cast list. I know. Ooh, 10 a.m. on Friday. I'll know. I'm going to be oh like my constantly gosh. refreshing the browsers. Yes. I think it'll be on the web. But. Oh, it's going to be a really good time in her life too. Yeah. Awesome. So did you grow up in a, in a family that fostered this activism mindset? Or is that something that you think more came from with you and you and on your own? Yes. Yeah, so I feel as though... Being a member of an underrepresented community was a a really huge driver. And also being a first-generation American, my daughter of immigrants, my parents are Jamaican, Mm -hmm. I I saw how hard they worked to get here and to build a really comfortable life for us here. And that really motivated me to do what I could to make sure that other members of my community have similar opportunities. And so that was always inspiring for me growing up and even into college, thinking about ways that I could contribute to that, or at least being an example or saying like, I'm making my parents proud by doing this. That was always like an internal driver for me. And it it changed in different ways how I live that out today. But yeah, I can trace that all throughout my childhood and growing up, that desire to want to do good for them. Yeah, that's beautiful. So Speaking to teachers about, yeah, I'm st- I'm, they're still teaching it in my head as we talk, as I talk to you, but um, <laughs> I know that a lot of teachers have a really hard time talking about really hard things in their classroom. Like they're hesitant to bring up, well, especially now with all now, of this yeah. critical race theory BS that's happening. <laughs> yeah. um, like they already were scared to, to have those sort of conversations about gender or about race or about um, privilege. Do you have any advice for teachers who want to have these conversations but are are scared to? That's, who yeah, that is hard. Well, I can only speak from experience and the fact that talking about it doesn't necessarily get easier, but I think the way you prepare yourself and set up and execute the conversation as far as how, what is this environment that I'm creating? Like, what are the visuals that I'm using? Like, am I making this feel safe? Or is this conversation being framed in a way where my student students will be able to easily sense my fear and apprehension and um, feel a little nervous about it? So mm-hmm. for me, even like, that's why I was so adamant about spending the, this past month creating resources specifically for teachers, like posters and like printables and bookmarks and stuff. I'm like, I want to make it as easy as I can for you in a society where it's becoming increasingly difficult to do so, to have those conversations and ease your way into those conversations. And so if I were a teacher, (laughs) well, God bless y'all because my Lord, I think that I would attempt it by tying it, taking a, a current event and tying it to a historical event that is very, very similar. I think that'll help. It kind of gives you not necessarily a crutch. I don't know what the word is, but it gives you like a parallel that you can run alongside without feeling like you're completely out in the deep end with this topic that's so hard to wrap your mind around. Just to show that history, yes, it repeats itself, 
but it also evolves. And like the way, for example, with racism that we're seeing it now, I mean, they same struggles years ago, but it just looks different. You know what I mean? And yeah. so I think if the underlying message is wrong, then wrong now, I think you can't go wrong with that. Like things that are wrong will always be wrong. And so you don't have to be like, oh, I'm scared to say something controversial. Like, no, it, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And I think your students, especially who are wrestling with all these different things and hearing so many things in their own communities and environments, I think that's doing them a service to, to be like, yeah, I'm going to maintain the integrity of this message and uh, the fact that wrong is wrong and right is right and just is just. And also like the tool of pretty, like I would definitely say to use that to your advantage too. I think either pretty or like something illustrative that can tie what you're talking to, to a real life object or thing that they can connect it to is such an invaluable technique because they're like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes that makes so much sense. Cause I seen that. I know what that looks like. Uh, so yeah, I think tying it to real world objects or things, object lessons are like my new, I love them. So I would, yeah. 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 That's well, just, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're all about. Our class curator, but, but the object is a work of art. So yeah, but it, it's, I like what you said. Cause I say this all the time that, you know, if you have a conversation about a work of art, it makes it easier to talk about the hard things because you're talking about that artwork. You're not, you're not going, Hey kids, let's talk about race today. You're like, let's look at this artwork and talk about this artwork. And we're going to talk about where race through this conversation about this artwork. And it just makes it just Ooh, a yeah. little bit easier to talk about. And, and, and it plays, it makes it a little bit less like personal in, and more right. ab- about something else. And so I like what you said about the history because it's, you know, you're talking about the history, but then you're yeah. talking about all this they've, through the history. So it just makes it a little bit, yeah, a little bit easier. And, you know, I'd also say one other thing, I think, when you mentioned history, it's reminded me of the fact that, of course, not every teacher teaches history. And so a lot of people, especially teachers, can often wonder like, okay, well, how can I even tie these hard conversations into what I teach? Because I don't even teach anything like that. But I think a super cool opportunity would be to seek out, you know, the professionals or the leaders or the historical figures that you might often reference in your work that started or originated a certain theory or concept or technique and look for underrepresented communities who also did, who also contributed to those things because highlighting them also gives you an opportunity to highlight their lives, their struggles and race and justice can often play a huge part in that. And that's another way to ease into those conversations as well. So I think that's also an added tip, like search for key leaders who may not be white and use that as an opportunity to, amplify but also educate in a different light as well yeah I think that's really important you know it's like an art it's just as an art teacher for an example if you're teaching a lesson about line and you want to use an artwork about line just choose a black artist yeah that has an artwork about line instead of yes. choosing you know your typical Van Gogh or whatever I mean exactly. Van Gogh's awesome but like you know you can you can easily make those substitutions and yeah it's a great value to your students Another thing that you said when you were giving advice was about creating a safe space for the students. And I think that so much of teaching is what's not said. It's it's in it's in your attitude, it's in your 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 passion, it's in the way you set up your classroom, it's in the way that you you know um, greet your students. So I love that you had brought you brought that up as creating this sort of safe space. And I think yeah, hanging your your posters up on the wall. That's going to trigger to a student when they see that on the wall, they'll say, oh, okay, this is a place that I know I can feel that this, yeah. this teacher is on my side. And it's just like little messages like that is, and, and those mixed with the interactions mixed with everything else, that student will feel more and more safe. Yeah, definitely. So we will link to, cause you mentioned you're creating stuff for teachers. So we'll link to that in the show notes so that teachers mm-hmm. can get their hands on those. Yeah, um, definitely. Those things for their classroom. And if they ever have, if anyone ever has ideas of what they would want to see, I always want to hear that too, because I am just wanting to help. And this is just my lane that I feel like I can run in with confidence and I would love to help in any way. So yeah, hit me up. Yeah. And so that's, that's actually a good segue to my next question, because one of uh, someone on my team mentioned, she saw this quote from you and was really moved by it. And she said, I'm going to read the quote and then I would mm-hmm. love for you to share your thoughts on it. But it says, I believe that you have the power to make a difference in your direct sphere of influence and bring about real change for causes that matter to you most. I think that that direct sphere of influence part, I think is really 
important. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit more for us? Yeah, definitely. So last year I drew an, a graphic about this topic, the sphere of influence, because I found myself always saying it. And I have this picture in my mind of what I was thinking of when I said it, but I realized it probably would be helpful to translate that. And so I drew this infographic where at the center, it says you, your sphere of influence. This, I'm talking about your sphere of influence at the center. It's you. And then there's pathways to different buildings as if I drew like a city or something, but the buildings would be named like your house, uh, your, your job, your place of worship, your businesses that you support, the school your students attend, local government, like all these ways that you're connected to your community very tangibly. And I would say these are areas within your own sphere of influence. These are areas that through direct or indirect action, through really big or really small ways, you can make a difference in causes and areas that you care about. And so, for example, even talking about the home, you know, the goal is to have to have an actively anti-racist family, right? You want to raise children who are care about inclus- inclusion, diversity, justice, and as well as you and your whole family, like prioritizing things that matter to you, no matter what that cause is, right? And so I think that there are steps that you can take to get there. And I wrote those steps along the path. And I would say things like having those hard conversations, dedicating yourself to ongoing learning and growth. And so I really believe that when you think about your own personal contribution in the world, it's easy to think of people who are doing really huge things and say, well, I can't do that. So I can't really do much. And that's so false because the biggest and most important thing about your sphere of influence is that nobody else has it. So there are people that you have influence over or have contact with that I will never meet, never influence. They will probably never even see my art. And so that while a beautiful opportunity is also a big responsibility because it means that none of us are off the hook with talking about what matters, especially like what we're passionate about because that gives us that personal connection and each of us has that story. Um, And yeah, you have what it takes to make a difference in your sphere of influence because it's something that you have that no one else has access to. Oh, I love that. And I think that it's, it's a really important message because I know a lot of people, me included, and many times is I'll, I'll get, I'll get really worked up about something, and I and I'm gonna be really passionate about something, but I feel completely helpless. Like they're like, what can I actually do? <laughs> and mm-hmm. so then I'm not only upset about the thing that's happening, but then I'm also feeling guilty that I'm not doing enough. But then it's just oh, like this yeah. cycle of negative emotions that are not helping anything. Yeah, um, that that helps you realize like what you can actually do. And what will actually make a difference and then kind of release the pressure of like this other stuff that I can't do and focus on, Hey, I can help my kids better understand, you know, the people that I am around on a day-to-day basis. So, Mm -hmm. yep. You have to trust and believe that this is a team effort and it relies on everybody doing their individual part. And so I think remembering that is encouraging. It made me think of your, though, that just made me think of your uh, boss at your old job who wouldn't wasn't receptive to you you yeah. uh, in the sphere of influence. I was like, he needs it. He needs some lessons. Maybe he's gotten some <laughs> since you, <laughs> since you left. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's wonderful. We'll, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well for the um, teacher or listeners to check out. Um, do you have any artists or artworks that have influenced you? Hmm. So it's interesting because I, it took me a while to even refer to myself as an artist because what I did, I feel like is just what I currently do. I feel like it's so, so simple, but there's some, I, I now know that the power that that's in that I find my inspiration, mostly not from artists, but from other forms of artwork, like literature, poetry and writings and things like that, speeches and things. And so I really, really love my Angelou. I love, I have her full collection of work and I'm really inspired by her poetry and how she ties and infuses justice and her experience with race and her experience as a woman and how that influenced her work in a way that made it super powerful. And so I found a lot of inspiration from her. I found a lot of inspiration from MLK, like truthfully, like not even in the cliche way, like his work is incredible in so many different ways. And so I have a collection of his works too. And I'd be reading that all the time. And I just draw inspiration from people who used every part of their like 
human experience to influence the work that they put out there because that's what made it so unique and so powerful. And I think everyone can take a lesson from that. Oh, I I want to write that quote down that you just like <laughs> thankfully it's recorded, but it was like <laughs> using what did you just say? Using your the full aspects of your human humanity basically yeah. to to create the, oh that was good. I'm gonna have to go back yeah. and listen to that again. <laughs> <laughs> um I love that. And I, you know, I would challenge you on, you know, calling your artwork simple. I mean, it is simple, but it's like simple in the most like calculated and precise, like slices Very through. Calculated. <laughs> yeah. Slices through. And I love that. And, and that's harder to do than something not simple, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's a really good point. And it's powerful. And it's like, it just gets you immediately, which, and that's why it's exploding the way it is. Cause it's, it's just gets right to the heart of it. Oh, I keep making awesome. this hand gesture. Y'all. <laughs> Listeners can't see it, but I'm just like, this is what it does. <laughs> so, okay. That's awesome. Okay. So we are sort of wrapping up. I know you have some book recommendations out there in the world. Do you have any book recommendations for our teachers who want to dive into this work? Oh, sure. Yes. So there is actually a really great book by Tiffany Jewell called This Book is Anti-Racist. It's aimed towards young adults, but it's filled with beautiful illustrations. She partnered with a a female woman of color illustrator. And it's just like so beginner friendly. It's so beautiful to look at. And it tackles so many different aspects of anti-racism in a way that is digestible. And so I love, love, love that book. It's beautiful and so fun. I also think a very good introduction to this work would be So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Oluo. Really great book. Again, really great introduction to the work in a way that is digestible. But she does not mince words. So just be prepared for it to be direct, but still, you know, very helpful and fruitful for you. So those are two books that I would highly recommend. I'm looking at all my other books like, is there anything else? (laughs) Probably those are two good ones to start with. That's though. a good one. I love, yeah, that this book is in a racist one sounds perfect because I think a lot of people need a sort of more beginner book like that. And yeah, so fun. I love yeah, it. I love it. That's good. We'll put links to those in the show notes as well. So we will also link to your website and your social channels. Can you tell listeners how they can connect with you online? Yeah, sure. You can find me everywhere at Oh Happy Danny. And my website is ohhappydanny.com. Um, okay. And so last question, I asked this of every podcast guest, mm-hmm. and that is which artwork changed your life? And it, it doesn't have to be a visual artwork. It can be, uh, I know you are talking about theater and different things too. So it can be. Yeah. Okay. I actually, something came to mind immediately. Okay. Uh, the poem, Our Deepest Fear by Marianne Williamson. Mm, completely. Yeah. Like from, from a child, like I was in a girl's small, like not small group, but like a girl's empowerment group at the boys and girls club when I was growing up and they gave each of us that poem in a frame and I would read it every day. And it really helped to this day. Like every single word is powerful and helpful. The the lines that stick out to me the most is even to this day is there's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others don't feel insecure around you. There's so many times where I tried to make myself small because Mm -hmm. I didn't want to make other people uncomfortable. And I see now like how much of myself I was holding back from the world because of that. And now in the season where I feel like people appreciate those things about me is just so liberating because I can freely pour out. And I feel like anyone in any stage of life can relate to that as well. Like not shrinking for anyone. Yes. I have that actually a poster of two. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so, so, that's so good. Yeah. Everyone and I should read that. It does. Cause I think that we're taught, especially as girls, that we don't, you don't want to stand out. You don't want to be too, too, too much. You don't want mm-hmm. to, you know, you need to just, you need to, um, you don't want to inconvenience everybody with your strong opinions and your strong feelings. So you just yeah. have to keep, them, keep them down. Yeah. And for the, yeah, it just doesn't work for, it's, it's just not the way we should be. Exactly. It's not the way change is made in the world. And that's not how you're happy. And that's not how the people around you are fulfilled. And so right. that's beautiful. Okay. We will, yeah, I'll find a link to that poem too. And put that in the show notes as well, because it is so good. Well, that was an amazing conversation. I am very inspired to, um, I wish I had a class to teach right now to bring your <laughs> art to, but I know Aww. that the people listening right now will, will do that and be so good. So yeah. thank you so thank much. You. 
Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And you're awesome. Thank you. (laughs) If your art appreciation classes were anything like mine, they happened in dark rooms with endless slides and boring lectures. Art in the dark. But art appreciation doesn't have to turn into nap time for your students. Start connecting your students to art with powerful class discussions. It can be intimidating to start talking about art with students, so teachers always want to know what they should say. The real question is what you should ask. You can get 82 questions to ask about almost any work of art for free on the Art Class Curator blog. The free download includes the list of questions, plus cards that you can cut out and laminate to use again and again. These versatile questions can be used in everything from bell ringers to group activities to critiques. Just go to artclasscurator.com slash questions to get your free copy today. Thank you so much for listening to the Art Class Curator podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and give us an honest rating on iTunes to help other teachers find us and hear these amazing art conversations and art teacher insights. Be sure to tune in next week for more art inspiration and curated conversations.